Hey, hey, you guys, round in the corner on this revival that took place in Omaha, Nebraska in 2024. One of the things I want you to notice if you have been watching this entire revival from the beginning to the end is each night, not only are more and pe more people showing up very curious about the Holy Spirit, but we begin to see an acceleration of the movement of the Holy Spirit. This often happens because of the expectation that people show up with and really just putting a demand on God and saying like, I need this in my life, I want this in my life, I, I, I want you to move in my life. I often tell people that we predetermine the encounter we're gonna have with God based on what we have decided ahead of time. Like the woman with the issue of blood when she said, if only I could touch the edge of his cloak, I know that I would be healed. So again, you can see that in play as this revival continues to go on that the acceleration of the move of God is amazing. So one of the things you'll notice is as soon as I open up the floor and start ministering is the children came forward. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, it's incredible to watch how these kids just came forward and really just surrendered to the Holy Spirit. All right, don't forget to click like, leave me a comment. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Um, hit the notification bell because we have more to this revival coming. All right, let's do it. But tonight I really feel like the Lord has laid on my heart just the importance of when God brings a word into your life, it is your word, his word plus your action that produces the promise. Now I'm going to say that again. It is his word. He brings a word into your life plus your action that produces the promise. And I think this is so important because a lot of times we receive a word from the Lord and we sit around waiting for the next step instead of taking the action upon the little nugget he gave to us. And then we, can, we wonder why we never come into the promise. And it's because we did not add to the word our action in order to produce the promise in our life. In other words, you and I are in partnership with God via the Holy Spirit. And you've heard me say it multiple times this week, and that is that the Holy Spirit is not your doer. He is your helper. He is your advocate. He is the one who has come to assist you, to help you be successful. He will cause you to be successful. He will cause you to walk in the ways of the Lord, but he will not do it for you. And the more you surrender to him and the more you get, say, God, yes, God, I will do it. I will let you have your way with me. Even when I can't see it, I will do it on faith. And so I want to talk to you tonight from John chapter 9. It's the story of the blind man who receives sight. And this is a man who was born blind. Okay, so this is an important message because I want you to realize that this man, it's not a man who at one point had sight and then lost his sight and now could not see. He was born blind and so he had no frame of reference of what it looked like to walk a foot. Okay, he had no frame of reference. When I say 10 feet, everybody kind of gets a mental image of 10 feet, except for Liz, because she has no concept of space. And so, but if I say 10, 12 inches, almost all of us immediately kind of picture a ruler in our mind. We, we capture something. When I say an apple, we all catch a vision in our head of something red and shiny, or perhaps it's green if you like green apples. And so, but the point is, is we have some sort of frame of reference of sight in our life. So this man was born blind, so he has no frame of reference of what one foot is, what south is, what north is, what east is, what west is. And it says, now as Jesus passed by him, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Pause. Now, this is an important question because during that time frame, they would often consider somebody who was born with some sort of deformity as a cursed family lineage. Okay, now I want you to remember me saying that. So the disciples also believing, buying into cultural and religious times assumed that there must be some sort of sin in this man's life or in his parents' life that he would be born into sin. So Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I would like to propose to you that God wants to capitalize on your weakest space, on your smallest spot, in the weakest part of your life where you are the most broken is where he is going to capitalize to reveal his work in your life. The Bible says in your greatest weakness, his power is perfected. He capitalizes on weaknesses in your life. Where the enemy wants to take you out, God wants to take you up. 
Come on, he wants to turn your prison into your platform. He wants to move you from the pit to the palace. We know all these blah, 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 little really cute acronyms that all of us quote, but don't get it, right? And so he's like, he says this, neither this man nor the parent sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him, meaning God who sent me, meaning Jesus, while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work, and as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva. Pause. Okay. In the cultural days, when somebody was bearing witness with a cursed family or a child who was born cursed, the way they bore witness or basically said, I agree, you are cursed, is they would spit on the child. So this man, his entire life, since the day he's been born, he's been walking around, not able to see, but always hearing this not noise. <laughs> and feeling spit hit his face. Feeling sp I can't make this up. So the very same sound, come on, that affirmed his brokenness is the exact same sound that Jesus used to affirm his healing. It is the, I would like to propose to you that God is going to use the very moment of your trauma to become your platform. He takes the moment of your weakness, your greatest brokenness, and it becomes your greatest strength. The very same sound that affirmed, spoke to him that you are broken, you are cursed, God used to bless him. And so he comes to him, he hears the sound, this blind man, again, never being able to see. <sighs> And then he hears a voice that he's never heard before and, before, and it says, he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, go. Everybody say, go. go. Everybody say, go. go. Everybody say, go. go. All over the scriptures, we hear this word, go. Get up. Arise. Move. Go. Get ready. Be ready. I dare you to read the Bible and make a list of all the action verbs that you find in one chapter. Because it is his word plus your action that brings forth the promise. He says to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated into sent. In other words, I am sending you. I know, sir, that the world has spat on you your entire life. I know that the world has seen you as nothing is cursed. I know that they think you are filled with sin. I know, but I say you are sent. And so he says to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so he went and he washed, came back seeing. Now, I want us to get a visual of this because this man not only had to walk to this pool of Siloam, but he had to walk in the dark, literally in the dark. And so there is a difference that we learn here between faith and literally blind faith, meaning I don't know what direction I'm going in. I don't know when you were a kid when you would play those pinata games and they put the blindfold and that, you know, and you'd have a blindfold on you and you'd be like, yeah, I know the pinata's right here. But then what would they do? They would spin you around and you had no sense of direction. And this man has absolutely no sense of direction. Not only is he blind, but he now has mud put on his eyes and he hears a voice that he's never heard before that says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, if I'm the blind man, do you know what I'm going to ask? I, can you take me by the hand? Can you walk me there? Can you point me in the right direction? Or I would say, I can't see where I'm going. But every step this man took was literally a step, not just of faith, but of literal blind faith. Every step he took was in the dark. And the Lord revealed to me several, probably several years ago, using this story specifically, saying, it is very possible, James, that this man was pointed in the totally wrong direction. He was going this way, and the pool of Siloam was this way. And God said, I love that you're walking in the dark. I honor your heart. I love that you're walking on faith. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move the pool of Siloam, and I'm going to cause you to walk right into it. Because I want to honor your obedience. I want to honor your walk of faith. And I would like to propose to you that it's possible that some of us, with a good heart, in a desire to obey God, as he says, go and wash, it's possible that we might be walking in a completely wrong direction, but God's going to cause you to hit the bullseye. Because he honors your walk of faith. 
he honors your walk of faith. And so this man goes and he, he says he comes back seeing, and of course we know the story goes on to say that he's questioned over and over and over again. It says, who spit in your eyes? Who, who healed you? All these things, and he's, he continuously says, the man, I don't know his name. I didn't see him. I couldn't see him. I was blind. I don't know. All I know is I once was blind, but now I... All I know is I once was blind, but now I... See, he didn't have theology, he didn't have doctrine, he didn't even have a name. All he had was a story, he had his own testimony, and that spoke to the people around him. But he had to have more than just a word from Jesus. He had to add to that an action. There was a doing that he had to do in order for the word to come to life in his eyes. I 100% believe that if he would have sat there, Jesus could have given them that word, and he could have been spit in his eyes, he could have been anointed, but if he would have sat there and done nothing, I don't believe his healing would have come to him. Because there was a partnership that happened in that moment. I'm reminded of the ten lepers in Luke chapter 17, where Jesus says, go and present yourselves to the temple, to the priests as healed. Now, I don't know if you know in that time frame, lepers were not allowed in the city. They had to be outside the city because they were considered dirty, they were considered sinful, they were considered a curse, and so they had to stay outside the city. So not only was it a sin for them to walk, a sin, a cultural sin, for them to walk through the, for audio, I'm doing rabbit ears, you're welcome. And so it's amazing how sometimes audio doesn't translate. But they're walking in the direction of the temple, and I want you to get this visual because the Bible says that as they went, they were healed. As they went, they were healed. And so we don't know from what point, from this point to the temple, were they actually healed. But I would imagine they're walking side by side, and with every step, they're reassessing whether or not anybody's starting to feel any different, sense any different. Are you healed yet? Are you healed yet? No, you're not healed. Should we take another step? I don't know. Should we take another? Let's try one more step. Are you healed yet? Are you healed yet? I don't know. Because if we get there and our healing hasn't come, we're going to be stoned to death. There was a lot at risk. There was a lot at stake here. Every step was a step of faith. But had they not walked that faith, had they not taken those steps, I don't believe their healing would have come. Could Jesus have done it? The Bible tells us in the Old Testament with name, and he says, can't the prophet just come out here and wave his hand over me, and I would be healed? Absolutely he can. But if you would partner with me and you would dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times, I want to do more than just heal you from leprosy. I want to deliver you from pride. I want to remove your arrogance. I want to take away your fear. And I don't want to just remove your leprosy. I want to restore your skin like that of a child. See, God is always up to something more than just what we see or what we think. But it requires a step of faith. It requires a step of faith. In 2 Kings chapter 3, there's a story of three kings. It's the, the king of Israel, Jehoram. He has just taken the, the kingship. He's just taken the throne after King Ahab. Remember Ahab and Jezebel? Everybody knows Ahab and Jezebel, right? So King Jehoram has stepped into this place. And the king of Moab has always had to pay a lot to the old king, uh, king Jeh or Ahab because he was a wicked king. And so Moab is upset. He's like, your dad was mean to me, and now I'm going to come after you. And Jehoram is like freaking out, so he says to Jehoshaphat, which is the king of Judah, which for you guys, that's the good land at this point. Israel is the not so good, Judah. They're all the part of, y'all, I used to get confused. I'd be like, which one's Israel? Quick, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, they're Israel, they had a split, okay? Northern kingdom is Israel, southern kingdom is Judah. They all become the nation of it. They're all God's children, but for a while they were a divided kingdom. Okay, there's a whole message in and of that self. So now, basically, King Jehoram comes and says, Hey, King Jehoshaphat, I need your help. I can't go fight this king by myself. I'm too weak. He's going to overtake me. And Jehoshaphat's like, I don't really want to, but because you are my people, I will be your people. We will be people together. And yes, I will come with you. They go out into the wilderness. They run into the king of Edom. The king of Edom's like, ooh, I'll, let me help you. I will come with you. So now there are three kings, but they run out of water. They have nothing to eat. They have nothing to drink. This is a great story. Look it up. They have nothing to drink. And so they say, well, don't you have a prophet that we can consult with? And they're like, ooh, let's call Elisha the prophet. So the Elisha prophet comes onto the scene. And basically, I'm, getting, I'm telling you this whole story to get to this point. He says to them this. 
hey, I want you to go out and I want you to dig some ditches. I want you to dig some trenches. Because tomorrow I'm going to fill the trenches with water, but it's not going to come by wind and it's not going to come by rain. It's not going to be in any ordinary way. And not only will you have enough water to feed your cattle, but I'll also cause you to overthrow the Moabites. Now, there's an invitation in that, James. The invitation is dig a ditch. And I got to dig this ditch blind. I got to walk on faith. I got to make a, take a risk. When he invited Noah to build an ark, there had never been rain before. I got to build something to avoid something that I've never experienced. This is all faith. It's all blind faith. But there's an invitation in every word that God gives to us, and it was when we combine our action with his invitation that the promise comes true. And so there's a partnership that we have. And so we know the story goes on that they dig the dishes. And actually, God goes on. He says, this is an easy thing for me. This is so easy. I don't know what y'all are. This is so easy for me. Goes back to that story where he says, is the arm of the Lord ever too short? It doesn't matter what your pit is. It doesn't matter what your darkness is. It's not too deep and it's not too dark for God. Praise him. Praise him. Come on, let's praise him. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. And so I want to invite you tonight to think about the words that you've been given from God. And I want you to ask him tonight, like, what's my next step? What's my next step? Now, the inclination is that for us to be like, God, give me the whole plan. He's like, no, baby, I'm just going to give you that next one step. And when you take that step, I'm going to give you the next step. And the Bible tells us that the Lord is, that the, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet. It's like a like a lamp unto my feet, right? And that lamp that's being spoken of is a, a little oil lamp. Those are the lamps that they had. And when you would hold a little oil lamp, it was said to illuminate approximately three feet in diameter. So that means if I'm holding a lamp right here, I can see approximately one and a half feet in front of me, which is approximately the size of one step. And when I take that step, then I'll see the next step in front of me. And so I want to challenge you all tonight to ask, am I adding to the word an action to bring forth my promise? Am I responding to God? Have I heard him say, this is what I want you to do? Am I willing to walk blind, even if I can't see where I'm going? I like to tell people, I'm like, just start moving. Just start moving. Do something. Do something. Because God can work with a moving something. And so, God, we come before you, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us and that you are in us. We thank you for the partnership that you invite us into. We thank you that you are not our doer. See, if he was our doer, he would be taking away our free will. That would just make us robots, and God doesn't like robots. He wants us to partner with him. And so, Father, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for a holy partnership. Come on, I want you to feel the stirring of the Spirit tonight. I want you to feel the stirring of the invitation. I want you to see, feel the stirring of the action that God is inviting you into. I want to ask you this question, are you ready? Are you ready? See, see, they had to be ready for the water. They had to have their, di di their ditches dug. They had to be ready. I'm reminded of in 1 Kings chapter 18, when Elijah, Elijah calls on the prophets of Baal, and they go up to the mountaintop, and they're like, we're going to have a rumble. You bring your bull, I'll bring my bull. You pick what bull you want. We're gonna, you build your altar, I'm going to build my altar. But Elijah built an altar for fire to fall upon. And some of us are calling for fire and we haven't built our altar. I'm going to say that again. Some of us are asking for fire, but we haven't built an altar. Some of us are asking for water, but we haven't dug our trenches. Some of us are asking for God to do things that we're not ready for. And God is asking us tonight, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you in the blocks and are you ready? Are you in position? Do you have your life in order? Do you have your relationship straightened out? Have you cleaned up your internal house? Have you consecrated yourself? That's what he says in Joshua chapter 5, verse 3. He says, prepare yourself, consecrate yourself, for tomorrow God is doing a great thing among you. 
And I wonder what we would live like in every to every day, every today we knew tomorrow was doing a great God was doing a great thing. If we knew that every day tomorrow God was doing a great thing and we were ready. We were ready. We were ready. What does what is God inviting you to do to be ready? Are you ready? A lot of us are wanting God to invite us, but we're not ready. I'm going to go ahead and, if you've got some worship, whatever, just go ahead and play it. And actually, Matt, I'm going to minister to you first. And so I just, oh, he's like, oh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, I mean, it's about readiness tonight. You can't do both? That's all right. I'll take you then. I'll take you, I'll take you over the music. We're asking for the readiness of the Lord. We're asking for the readiness of the Lord. See, a lot of us are asking for the entire plan. We want the whole blueprint. And God's like, I just want, I'm just, I just want you to take the next step. I just want you to take the next step. That's it. Go ahead and hands out. Father, I just bless this pastor of the house. I bless him, Holy Spirit, with the readiness. The readiness, the yes and amen that says, I will, I will follow you blindly, Lord. Just feel that presence just coming on you. I don't need to have the blueprint. I don't need to know the right direction. I just need to give you my yes. And today I'm going to give you my yes, and I'm going to take that next step, and I'm going to do it with blind faith. And so I shift you, Matt, even right now from this idea of faith to an understanding of blind faith. I don't see it. I don't know it. I don't get it. But today I'm going to begin to dig my trenches. I'm going to begin to dig my trenches. God, if you say stretch out my hand, it doesn't matter how crippled it is. I'm going to do all that I can to stretch out my hand that it would be healed. If you say, take up my mat and walk, I don't care how broken my legs are. I'm going to stand and I'm going to take up my, come on, I'm going to do what I couldn't do in order to enforce the promise of God in my life. I'm going to do what I never thought I could do. Come on, because that's what God does in the, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. He always invites people to do what they couldn't do. <laughs> and we want God to be easy on us and say, invite Invite me to do something that fits right, that feels good, that's going to be easy. But God invites us to do something that we can't do in our own natural man. And so I thank you, Holy Spirit, for Pastor Matt. I pray, Holy Spirit, for blind faith to begin to fall upon him. Even right now, there we go, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Who's next? I'm not going to wait. Let's go. Get it while it's hot. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just activating faith tonight. I don't know if the Lord's going to work prophetically, not prophetically, but I'm activating blind faith tonight to do something you've never thought you could do, to hear the voice of the Lord, and when he says, I want you to X, you're like, yes, I'm running in that direction, and I'm trusting you with every step. And I will not stop running and I will not stop trusting you and I will not stop walking in that direction until I see the fruition of my promise. Come on, we need to have some tenacity as a people of God. We need to rise up and have some courage. We need to be stubborn and resilient for the word of God in our life. And if you haven't gotten it yet, then don't stop doing what he told you. See, we, we do what God tells us to do and then we're like, it didn't work. And then we stop doing it. But we need to be determined that I'm going to keep doing it until God says stop doing it. And so I speak over you a blind faith loosed right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Close your eyes for me. You got her. God, we speak a blind faith. Blind faith. Loose it right now in Jesus' name. Come on. A, a reckless faith. And when I say reckless, I don't mean like disobedience. I mean, I am carefree and reckless in the kingdom in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. More. More. God is inviting you into more. He is inviting you. have heard correctly. What you have already done. The faith that you've already walked in is just a scratching of the surface of what, how God wants to move in and through your life. You haven't seen anything yet. He's a God who's immeasurably greater than you can ever ask or imagine. More. He wants to do more. I hear the Father say, ask me for more. Expect me for more. Expect more out of yourself. Think bigger, dream bigger, and expect more. We lose a blind faith. We lose it right now in the name of Jesus Christ. 
from the top of your head all the way down to the tips of your toes. We thank you, Holy Spirit. There we go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Caden, right? Yeah. Ah, yes. Hands out like this. Are you willing to do anything that God asks you to do? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. You're willing to be all in. Yes. If he gave you a shovel and said, I want you to go dig a trench outside right now, would you do it? Yes. Would you get your sweatshirt dirty, your, hair, your shoes dirty, yes. your hair all muscled up? You're willing to say, God, anything you want, yes. I will do it. Yes. Perfect. Close your eyes for me. God, I thank you. Come on. God wants you to know that your yes is nothing compared to his yes. It is nothing compared to his yes. Come on, our yes is just a response to the yes he first spoke to us. We're unable to give him a yes except by his yes that he gave to us first. We'll bring you over here, baby. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, that is so lovely. Tell me your name, baby. Gabriel. Gabriel, go ahead and close your eyes for me. Gabriel, I want you to just feel and know that the Lord loves you. Really, that's all this is about. It's just really coming in touch with God and letting God come in touch with you. It's about being being confident that God loves you and that he has a plan for you, Gabriel, that all the days of your life, he's going to go before you, he's going to be beside you, and he's going to watch from behind you. And so I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the love of God that is in him and upon him in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. He did a little two-step, didn't he? <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Tell me your name again, baby. Easton. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask you the same thing that I asked Caden. Are you ready? Are you ready to give God your yes? Come on, if he asks you to do something hard, will you be like, yes, yes? yes. Because God doesn't invite just anybody, right? But he's inviting you tonight. Go ahead and close your eyes. God, I thank you for the yes, the resounding yes that you've placed in Easton. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that he would feel, know, and he would be encountered by your love tonight, that he would be enraptured by your love, that he would never be the same. I call forth an internal shift to switch in you right now, tonight, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would never be the same. See, I could preach anything I wanted to tonight, but at the end of the day, none of these kids are going to remember what I preached. But you know what they're going to remember? They're going to remember the touch of God. That's what they're going to remember. I think we have a church that does a little too much talking and needs to do a little more demonstrating. And at the end of the day, I don't remember really good messages that were spoken years ago. But things I do remember is when I'm touched by God. When I'm